radio's own show, Behind the Mic. Radio, with a switch of a dial, radio brings you tragedy, comedy, entertainment, information, education, a whole world at your command. There are stories behind radio, stories behind your favorite program and favorite personalities and radio people you never hear of. Stories as amusing, dramatic, and as interesting as any make-believe stories you hear on the air. And that's what we give you, the human interest, the glamour, the tragedy, the comedy, and information that are behind the mic. And now, presenting a man whose name since the beginning of broadcasting has been a byword in radio, Graham McNamee. Thank you, Jill Martin. Thank you. And good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen of the radio audience. We've had many people on this program who make their living from radio in strange ways. There was, for instance, one man who imitated animals and a young lady who impersonated a multitude of babies on script shows. But our next guest makes her living in radio in a way that tops all of them. And here she is to tell you all about it, Hildegard Halliday. <laughs> Hildegard, what is your radio specialty? Well, I make a living by... <laughs> Sneezing. <laughs> you, you mean you're an expert in uh, pseudo-nasal explosion. In other words, when a radio director has a character in a script who has a lot of sneezing, he casts you in the part, huh? Well, it certainly seems to work out that way. I've done all kinds of sneezes on the Rudy Valley, Tommy Riggs, Fred Allen, Aunt Jenny, Robert Benchley, and many other programs. Well, do you mind telling us how you're able to sneeze that way at a moment's notice, Hildegard? Oh, I can sneeze like all get out if I just imagine very hard that I have a cold and chill. I see. There's cold in them, there chills. <laughs> Besides working yourself into the part psychologically, uh, do you get many hints from observation? Yes, I do. I recently got a great many hints from observing a lady at a cocktail party. You know, Graham, I never realized how bad hay fever was until I saw her. Yeah. <laughs> oh, how do you do, Lulu? Oh, I've done well. Oh, my dear, I've done well at all. Well, it's just the hay fever, cubs and goes. <laughs> I really didn't feel like coming here today, but I just thought I should. <laughs> oh, no, I'll just stand here and chat with a few people. How do you do, dear? How are you? <laughs> oh, I've done well. Oh, I've done well at all. Well, I may look well, but nobody knows how I suffer. You know, I've been thinking so much about you lately. I saw your husband lunching with such a nice-looking woman the other day. <laughs> your sister, I suppose? Oh, you don't have a sister. <laughs> well, we never know, do we? <laughs> oh, Kate! Kate, my dear, I've been wanting to get... I've been wanting to get... I've been wanting to get... <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, darling, I can't help it. They're serving martinis around here, and I'm allergic to vermouth. <laughs> oh, we start to sing up. I've just been wanting to congratulate you on your husband being made a congressman. <laughs> I hope he doesn't get besmirched. <laughs> I always say politics is so common, what with letting everybody vote. <laughs> oh, I don't. I don't know a thing about politics, but I do know what I like. <laughs> what, dear? Uncle Joe? Oh, he's doing very poorly. We expect to bury him before long. <laughs> well, he's lived his life. We never... <laughs> we never could tell what our own... <laughs> well, we never know what our... <laughs> oh, oh, you know, that's the silliest thing you'd ever know when you're going... <laughs> no, my husband's away on one of his trips. Well, I wanted to go away with him, but he said he'd feel better off to have me at home. He said he didn't want anything to happen to me. He knew he'd never find another... <laughs> oh, I'm afraid one of my spells is coming on. Oh, no, they're not dangerous. I just sort of stretch out the floor and sniff them. I think I should go. Lulu, 
Lulu, dear, I'm going home. I really don't feel I could stay any longer, but I've had such a jolly time. Take care of yourself, won't you? There's so, so, many, there's so many people dying this year. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, Hildegard Halliday. <laughs> You've got me doing it now. Each week, puzzled, sometimes frightened, sometimes despairing people seek the advice of social expert John J. Anthony on his radio Goodwill Hour hoping that he will point out a solution of their problems. You have heard him advise them. But here are stories of what happens to these people after they have left Mr. Anthony's program. Stories the radio public never hears. Tonight, for the first time, Behind the Mic brings you the story of the result of Mr. Anthony's advice in what he calls his most astounding case. Mr. John J. Anthony. <laughs> Mr. Anthony, will you please tell us about that story? Uh, yes, Mr. McNamee. That case gave me the most terrific shock I've ever had during my career in radio. On one week's program, I asked one man to state his problem, and to my shock and amazement, he began like this. I said to him, what is your business? And he said, Mr. Mr. Anthony, Anthony, my business is killing. What do you mean? I'm a gunner in the Navy, and I'm going to kill a man. Do you realize what you're saying? Yes, I do, but it's the only way out. You see, I'm in love with a woman, and she's in love with me. But she's married, and her husband won't give her a divorce. He won't divorce her, well, out of sheer cussedness. He doesn't love her, but he doesn't want me to marry her. I've decided that there's only one thing to do, and that's to put him out of the way. That's the only way she'll get her freedom. So I'm going to kill him. You must have been shocked when you heard that. What did you do then, Mr. Anthony? Naturally, I pointed out to him that he certainly wasn't going to be able to marry this woman if he killed her husband. He'd be arrested and executed, and that would be the end of it. In the meantime, I wrote a note to the announcer and handed it to him. In the note, I told the announcer to have this man's overcoat, which he had hung outside the studio, searched. Inside the man's coat was found a large, heavy jack handle, a perfect instrument with which to club someone. So I knew he was serious in his intention. I asked him to wait for me after the show, and he did. When the program was over, I told him that I could very easily have him committed to Bellevue Hospital for psychiatric examination to determine his sanity, but I was more anxious to straighten him out. I made him promise that he would do nothing that evening, but would come to see me the following day at my office. He promised. Did you feel his promise was worth anything? Oh, yes, in, in this case. After all, he had been contemplating killing this man for some time, and he'd come to me for help, and he still wanted it. And so he wasn't going to do anything until at least after he had seen me again. Well, why did you have him come to your office? Well, because I wanted to get in touch with a well-known psychiatrist, have him see the sailor, and try to straighten him out, which was exactly what he did in a series of interviews. And how did it all end? Did the man divorce his wife, and did the sailor marry her? Oh, no, Graham. It might have happened that way in a story, but not in real life. That was different. You see, the psychiatrist confirmed what I had suspected all along. The sailor wasn't really in love with this woman. It was a case of frustration. It probably wanted to marry her at one time, but since he wasn't and since she was married, that was quite impossible. But the fact that he couldn't made him all the more determined that he would, even if he had to kill her husband to do it. The finish of the story, Graham, is that the husband, when he discovered that the sailor didn't want to marry his wife, gave her a divorce. I got her a job, the sailor didn't marry her, but he didn't kill the husband either. And there you are. And thank you, John J. Anthony, for an unusual behind the mic story. <laughs> Oddities in Radio, presenting odd little true stories that help make radio sometimes amusing, sometimes exasperating, but always interesting to the people in it. This week's oddity. A few weeks ago, Len Doyle, radio actor, best known perhaps for his interpretation of the part of Harrington, special cop, in the radio series, Mr. District Attorney, was speeding along a highway near New York on his way to his broadcast. Hey, when are 
none of you smart guys going to learn you can't go 70 miles an hour out here. Yeah, uh, 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 officer, I, I was just uh, driving along thinking of my grandmother. I just looked at the speedometer. Baloney, baloney, I had you clocked. You're the third guy in the last hour I've had to give a ticket to. Oh, uh, uh, you're not going to give me a ticket, are you? I'm awfully sorry. I... So I'm not going to give you a ticket? Well, I'm... Uh... Well, here it is. Let's see your license number. Yeah, uh, yeah. Mm. Mm, 70 miles an hour. Where do you think you're going? To a fire? <laughs> no, I, as a matter of fact, I was on the way to a radio broadcast. I... And do you mind telling me why you have to go 70 miles an hour to a radio broadcast? Well, uh... Well, officer, you've heard of Mr. District Attorney, haven't you? Well, I'm I'm Harrington of the District Attorney's Office. You're what? I'm Harrington of the District Attorney's Office. Hey, some of you guys talk too soon, and some of you don't talk soon enough. On your way, buddy. I don't want to get in no trouble with the District Attorney. Yeah. <laughs> Behind the Mic salutes a program you love. We in radio believe that radio has a tradition of which it can well be proud. A tradition of good programs that linger fondly in your memory. And so each week, we intend to bring you a star or a part of some program you used to hear. A program that you loved. Tonight, Behind the Mic salutes the old RKO Hour. One of the really top-notch programs of ten years ago was this same RKO Theater of the Air. This was a program that was particularly dear to me because for some time I was its announcer. So come back with us for a few brief moments to 1930 in the RKO Hour with two of its original stars, Georgie Price and Tom Kennedy. The RKO Hour. <laughs> This message so the world will know From Maine to California And up to Montreal Down the dear old New Orleans You'll hear a friendly call The brightest stars From here to Mars Will brighten up your radio On Tuesday night when tuning in Remember I was crooning in The voice of the RKO Good evening ladies and gentlemen of the radio audience that was Tom Kennedy singing the RKO song, and this is Graham McNamee speaking. We welcome you to another weekly performance of the RKO Theater of the Air, sponsored jointly by Radio Keith Offium and Radio Pictures, who produce for the entertainment of you and your family the best in vaudeville and talking and silent pictures. <laughs> the features are selected each week from among the army numbering 12,000 artists, headliners, and stars who are now appearing on this great circuit of theaters spreading from Boston to San Francisco and from Ottawa to New Orleans. And now we are pleased to turn over the mic to that rising young star of musical comedy and vaudeville, Jack Benny. Hello again, and thank you, Graham. It's pretty hard for a fellow who's used to working before an audience to face this thing they call a microphone in an empty studio, you know. <laughs> uh, say, can you imagine doing this for a living? But thank goodness I'll never have to. Not as long as I got my violin. But enough of this chit-chat. And now a little of the latest gossip from Hollywood, as told by Bill Rainey. Big things are expected of Radio Pictures' next great effort, Street Girl, starring Betty Compton and Jack Oakey with an unusual musical score written by Sam Stepp and Oscar Levant. Rod the Roke was wearing old clothes to the studio and was refused admittance by a new gatekeeper. He had to wait until he was identified by an assistant cameraman before being allowed to enter. B.B. Daniels has lost so much weight working on a new all-dialogue picture, Dixiana, that she has to drink a pint of cream a day. Dolores Costello enjoyed her vacation on the water so much that she is reluctant to return to work. George Sidney and Charlie Murray may fight on the screen, but around the studios they are inseparable companions. Now here is a real hot item. Radio Pictures has purchased the rights to Edna Ferber's Cimarron, and that picture will go into production soon and will be ready for release next fall. Richard Dix will be starred in the role of Yancey Cravat. That is one picture that I'm sure you'll all want to see. <laughs> And now I want to introduce to you a young fellow who is headlining at the Palace Theater in New York, one of the most versatile actors in RKO vaudeville, a man who can sing, tell jokes, do imitations. He's great doing all of them, Georgie Price. And now Georgie will sing in his own inimitable style, 
Bye Bye Blackbird. I'll pack up all my care, oh, here I go, I'm singing low. Bye Bye My Blackbird, where somebody waits for me, sugar sweet and so is she. Bye bye, my blackbird. No one here can laugh and understand me. And all the hard luck stories they all hand me. So make my bed and light the light. I'll be home late tonight. Blackbird, bye bye. You know, it's really a bye bye, blackbird for me. What do you mean, Georgie? Well, when I close at the Palace tomorrow night. I'm going on a 55-week vaudeville tour, and every week a different town. Good old vaudeville. Yes, sir. If it wasn't for the good old two-a-day, I'd be worried about eating my three-a-day. Georgie, don't tell me the stock market got you, too. Oh, no, I should say not. They didn't get me. I was too smart for them. Well, I'm glad to hear that. Oh, yes. I bought a stock last year. It cost me $168 a share. I looked in the paper this morning. Where do you think it's selling? I don't know. <laughs> Two minus. <laughs> yeah, but I don't have to worry. I bought mine outright. You know, that's the idea. The idea is to buy them and put them away. That's right. Buy them and put them away. Mm -hmm. I'm afraid they're going to put me away with them. <laughs> yes, sir, Graham. I have it all figured out that if I sing 387,472 songs, I'll be exactly even for Goldman Sachs alone. <laughs> well, 1930 is a pretty bad year, Georgie. I hear a lot of people complaining. Isn't it the truth? Yeah. A lot of people are comp complaining this year. But something tells me that in a few years from now, we'll be looking back at 1930 and speaking about it as the good old days. But I'm not worried, Graham. Thank goodness they'll always be vaudeville. Yeah. So I'll just pack up all my care and hold. Here I go, I'm singing low. Bye-bye, my blackbird. Where somebody waits for me, sugar sweet and so is she. Bye-bye, my blackbird. No one here can love and understand me. And all oh, the hard luck stories they all hand me. Make my bed and light the light. I'll be home late tonight. Blackbird, bye-bye. Thank you, Georgie Price and Jack Benny. Next Tuesday at this time, another Radio Keith Orpheum Hour will be presented. Next week, our guests will include that pennant-winning battery of songland, Van and Schenck, Fanny Ward, who is known throughout the world as the immortal flapper, the diving Venus, Annette Kellerman, and that rising young orchestra leader, Rudy Valley and his Connecticut Yankees, now appearing at Keith's Riverside Theater in New York. And so, until next Tuesday evening, we bid you good night as Tom Kennedy sings the Radio Keith Orpheum song. Hello, hello, the RKO is sending out this message so the world will know. From Maine to California and up to Montreal, down to dear old New Orleans, you'll hear a friendly call. The brightest stars from here to Mars will brighten up your radio. Now, if you have enjoyed the show, then why not write and tell us so the voice of the RKO. Thank you, Georgie Price and Tom Kennedy, for helping to recreate a few moments from a great program. from listeners. Each week we invite the listeners of Behind the Mic to write us questions about radio. And the three or four we consider to be of most general interest, we have answered on the air by the radio editor of some outstanding newspaper or magazine. Tonight's questions will be answered by Joe Ranson, radio editor of the Brooklyn Daily Eagle. <laughs> Mr. Ranson, Mr. Ralph Spencer of Toledo, Ohio wants to know what is the oldest commercial coast-to-coast -coast program still on the air. Well, Mr. Spencer, the oldest commercial coast-to-coast -coast program still on the air is the city service program. It originally started in 1925 and was on the air intermittently until 1927, at which time it went on regularly, summer and winter, and is now enjoying its 13th consecutive year. Miss Helen Ruth Wegman of New York writes in to ask, can you tell me what was the earliest theme song used on the air? Well, Miss Wegman, as far as I can find out, the earliest radio theme song was used by the Happiness Boys back in the early 20s. And it began something like this. How do you do, everybody? How do you do? How do you do, everybody? How are you? Can't you... 
Can't you sing it? <laughs> Not with this throat. <laughs> Miss uh, Margaret Bart of Phoenix, Arizona asks, can you tell me if Yehudi, who Jerry Colonna mentions on Bob Hope's program, was Jerry's own idea? Well, according to the advertising agency which produces the Bob Hope show, Yehudi was created by one of the script writers. Yehudi was originally to be used only for one show, but he proved so popular that they've been writing him into almost every script. Mr. Henry Zucor of St. Louis, Missouri says this. Last week, I heard Bill Stern interview the Navy football coach, Swede Larson, on behind the mic in a supposed telephone conversation. How was Swede Larson made to sound as if he was on the phone? Mr. Zucker refers to this type of sound, of course. Every week, Behind the Mic brings you true, amusing, and thrilling stories behind radio. Well, Mr. Zucker, this effect is achieved in this way. The microphone into which Major Larson spoke was the same as any other microphone. However, the voice comes from the mic into the control room and goes through a device known as a filter box, which eliminates the high or low tones of the voice. Thus, the voice is thinned in such a way as to make it sound as if it was on the telephone. Thank you, Joe Ranson, for answering those questions. Thanks. <laughs> One of the most interesting behind-the-mic stories I have yet heard concerns Haven McQuarrie, who is now on tour with his popular Your Marriage Club program. This story might be entitled, The Strange Way in Which a Radio Broadcast Affected a Member of the Studio Audience. A couple of years ago, Haven McQuarrie was presenting his So You Want to Be an Actor broadcast from a theater in the Middle West. In that program, you know, McQuarrie would select several amateurs from the studio audience, explain to them the situation of a scene, and then have them act it out under his direction. Incidentally, Haven used to give his directions through a megaphone. For the studio warm-up, before the broadcast, he'd call a stooge out of the audience, his brother, by the way, and uh, they would do a comedy act in which Haven would direct him. The stooge would ball the whole thing up, and in the end, Haven would throw the megaphone at his head. He would duck, and the megaphone would strike a copper plate hanging over the door, making a terrific clatter. Everyone would think the megaphone had hit the stooge, and that Haven was crazy. Well, one night, while Haven and his brother were doing their studio warm-up before the broadcast, they were in the middle of their act, and... Uh... Now, look, you're getting everything wrong. Here's the situation. You're trying to sneak into your apartment. You know that if you wake up your wife, she's going to sock you with a rolling pin, so you want to be very quiet. Now, open the door quietly. I said quietly. Oh, you, you mean like this? Oh, forget it. Just come inside. Now, you're closing the door, and you don't want to make any noise. No noise! Oh, all right. I'll, I'll try it again. No, I can't stand it anymore. This is the finish. You idiot! <laughs> Well, the megaphone hit the copper plate in back of Haven's brother, and a woman in the audience screamed. The following day, as Haven was coming out of his hotel, a tall, raw-boned man, looking like a prosperous farmer, came up to Haven and said to him, Mr. McQuarrie, I feel I've just got to explain something to you. You heard a scream in the theater yesterday morning during your act, didn't you? Uh, yes, I did. Well, Mr. McQuarrie, that was my wife. She just hasn't been herself for the past five years, ever since our baby was a few months old and almost died. And she's been getting steadily worse. She doesn't recognize any of us at all. So I bought a farm way out in the country where we'd be away from everybody and I could take care of her myself. She had terrible headaches, but the doctor said there was nothing that could be done for her. Oh, that's too bad. Yes, it was. But yesterday I had a brain specialist come to see her. We were taking her to a hospital for observation. The doctor thought something might be done to relieve the pressure on her brain. As we were driving through this town last night, our car broke down. Luckily, we were close to a garage. I called the garage man over, and after examining the car, he said... Say, it's going to take about an hour to fix this. We can't wait here in the garage. It's freezing cold. I've got my wife with me. Well, let me see. You know what? We could go across the street to that theater and wait there. They're doing a radio broadcast there, but they might let you in. It's warm inside. Doctor, do you think it'll be all right? Yes, I think that's the best thing we can do. We don't want it to freeze out here. 
All right, we'll go over to the theater, and we'll be back in an hour. We can sit back here, Doctor, in the last row. Here are three seats right here. You take this one, I'll sit here. Right, that's better. I said no noise! Oh, oh, all right. Try it again now. Go I'll try it again. Oh, I can't stand it anymore. This is the finish, you idiot. <laughs> Darling, darling, are you all right? Where is he? Where's my baby? Doctor, did you hear that? <laughs> Mr. McQuarrie, that was the first time that she'd asked for our baby in five years. The doctor said that the excitement of seeing you almost hit that man had relieved the pressure on her brain, and it won't be long before she's well. And all I can say is, thank heaven the car broke down and you were in that theater. And Haven McQuarrie hears from that man every once in a while. And I can tell you that his wife is well and happy again. Ladies and gentlemen, if you have any question about the inside of radio that you wish answered on the air, write a letter to us. Address it to Graham McNamee, behind the mic, National Broadcasting Company, New York City. As many questions as possible will be answered by mail, and those we feel to be of most general interest will be answered on this program. Be sure to listen in next week when we will bring you the unusual story behind one of radio's most popular programs, We the People. Inside stuff about quiz programs as told by Uncle Jim of Uncle Jim's Question B, news commentator John B. Kennedy, and more of the human interest, the glamour, the comedy, and the drama that are found behind the mic. This is Graham McNamee speaking. Good afternoon, all. is written by Mort Lewis. Original music is composed and conducted by Ernie Watson. Jack Benny and Haven McQuarrie were impersonated by Ward Wilson, and this is the National Broadcasting Company. <laughs>